canning, canning red wine jelly and jams with the CSU Extension Office today. Uh, we hope that this program uh, gives you some inspiration and some lifelong, lifelong learning opportunities for you to take home with you, as well as uh, while you're at home, hopefully you're learning stuff while you're there. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for everybody who is participating tonight. If you are streaming in, please uh, write in the comment section where you're streaming from, um, and feel free if you are an alum to share your the year that you graduated from as well. Um, it's always fun to see where we have alums that are uh, coming in uh, virtually with us. Um, wherever you are turning in from, we are so that glad that you're here too. If you're on YouTube or if you're on StreamYard, we're so happy that you're uh, making the time to come here. Uh, to many of our attendees, uh, the CSU Alumni Association members, thank you so much. Uh, without you, we would not be able to do programs like this. Your membership means so much to us, uh, and you make events like this possible for us to do for you. Uh, if you're ever interested to hear more about the membership uh, for the Alumni Association, uh, feel free to explore our Alumni Association alumni app. It is free. Um, it is called the CSU alumni app uh, right on any type of smartphone device. Um, in just a moment, I will put in the comments my contact information if you are having any trouble with technology um, or if you are having any issues with StreamYard, please feel free to email me or give me a phone call and I will be able to help you out as the presentation is going on. Um, also, feel free to check out other uh, information that is going on or other YouTube uh, channels and videos that we have done in the past, uh, feel free to check out everything. We've had stuff from the beginning of our COVID time uh, up until now as well. Uh, now I'm excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, number one, we have Sheila Gaines is the CSU Extension agent down in the Arapahoe County Extension Office. Um, she is also an alum of uh, class of 81. 81. That's worse, yeah. And then uh, we also have Mary Snow, uh, who is down here at the extension office as well. So without further ado, I will let you guys take care of it. And again, thanks so much. Go Rams. Thanks, Corey. Thanks for inviting us to do this. This is the first time we've done a hybrid. We're a live audience plus streaming. So bear with us if we um, have a few little clunky moments from time to time. So welcome to the CSU extension. Um, presentation to the Alumni Association on canning wood, red wine jelly. So why would we make wine jelly? Well, number one, it's fun um, to eat wine jelly, to make wine jelly, and to gift wine jelly. So it's coming that time of year that you might want to start making gifts from your kitchen. It's also super easy. It's the easiest jelly you will ever make because you didn't have to crush the grapes or the peaches or whatever other fruit that you were gonna make jelly or jam out of, you're just gonna pour it right out of the bottle. And it's really um, a good way to learn the principles of boiling water bath. Some people call it hot water bath as well, canning. And you can use those same principles when you're canning any kind of jam, jelly, marmalade, when you're canning pickles, canning fruits, or canning acidified tomatoes. So the same principles that you're going to learn with wine jelly, you can apply to canning other high acid foods. Um, so as Colorado State University, you may or may not be aware, we're the land grant college for Colorado. And as the land grant college, we have three major responsibilities. And those are resident instruction. So we have students on campus that are getting their bachelor's degrees, master's, PhD, postdocs. Our other responsibility is research. It is a responsibility that we take fairly seriously um, that we are adding to the body of knowledge as a university. And the other thing that the Land Grant College does is we're required to extend or outreach to all of the people in Colorado. Because even though you might be not be paying tuition today, maybe you paid it in the past or you're paying it for um, either your own students or grandchildren, um, all of the people of Colorado need to benefit from what's going on, what we know and what we learn at the university. So that's what Extension does. And today's program is a perfect example of what uh, that land-grant college does through the Extension, that third piece of what we're required to do. And Mary and I both do that. Mary works in the Jefferson County Extension Office, and I work in the Arapahoe County Extension Office. Most counties in Colorado have an Extension presence, 
And if they don't have enough population to support their own office, they're often tied to a regional or area office. Um, so what we're going to do also in the back, Claudia, do you want to run up here real quick? I want to introduce you to Claudia Meeks. Claudia works in the Arapahoe County Extension Office and Claudia is a 4-H youth development agent and she's helping Corey with the technology, running the different cameras and getting it set up here. So thanks, Claudia. So you should have received um, from Corey um, some documents that are handouts and one of them is three ups so you can take notes of the PowerPoint we're gonna be using tonight. Another one is a collection of four different recipes. The first one of the four is for red wine jelly. And then there's a couple of other adaptations for using wine and jams or jellies there. And then the third one is one called preserving jams and jellies. And it talks about high altitude changes, as well as it goes into quite a bit of detail about the pH that's required to make the pectin gel and how wine fits into that and why we need to add lemon juice to make it a little bit more acidic so that the gel um, will work. Um, you should also have received some links so that you could download some information from Preserve Smart. This is an incredible website that CSU Extension has developed as well. It's an app for your phone, either Android or Apple, and you can, with this app on your phone, go in and find the directions uh, for preserving just about anything you want to do, whether it's um, vegetables, fruits, jams, jellies, and it also helps you figure out those high altitude conversions. Um, also, there should be a link for going to the fact sheet on making jellies, which gives you even more in-depth information. So what we're going to do tonight, our agenda includes, Mary's going to start with the demonstration because we know you really want to see this. So she's gonna start a demonstration of making the red wine jelly. Then when it all gets into the pot and we're waiting for it to come up, we're gonna to break to me and I'm gonna go through some PowerPoint slides um, talking about the principles that she's already showed you. And then when it comes up again, she's gonna put the sugar in. While we're waiting for that to come up, we'll go through the slides a little bit more. When she's ready to actually put it into the jars and get it processed, We'll go back to Mary and then when she's got it in the canner and then we have to wait for it to come back up to a boil and then time it inside the canner then we're going to go over some of the principles of using a hot water bath canner and at the end we'll answer any questions so use your chat um, button if you have it and if they're with YouTube do they have an opportunity to ask questions I don't yeah. know how they do that okay yeah, they can, uh, there's a chat feature on YouTube and we can see that as well there you go so I'm gonna let Mary start with um, what she's doing here we have some equipment. This is an electric water bath canner. You don't have to have one. It's a nice to have though. Um, so this one, you do not have to put on a burner. It has its own electric burner underneath. And this is more a traditional canner. And then we have an old fashioned enamelware back there. So put any large pot with a rack and a lid and you're good to go. So Mary, I'm gonna let you demonstrate. Okay. So one of the reasons that I, we like this electric water bath canner is, is it comes up to a boil very quickly. Um, and in high elevation, sometimes it takes a bit of time for our water to come up to a good boil. Um, I know when I'm working at home, um, it takes forever at home. And so I like using the electric one at home. It frees up a burner as well as um, comes up quicker. So that's one of the reasons I like it. And I like using it for demos as well. So, okay, we're going to... Put the camera on the kettle. Put the camera on the kettle. We're going to turn this on as high as it will go, and we're going to start with the wine. We're going to use this one. Mm -hmm. So today we're using a Cabernet Sauvignon. Is that right? Did you say it? Cab Sauv. A Cab Sauv. Okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> it's a dark red wine. Is what we're using. Um, this is a 750 milliliter bottle, which is a typical size, and it should be exactly what the recipe calls for. And the alcohol content on that one is 13%. And the alcohol content, Sheila just said, is 13%. I don't know if you heard her or not. Anyway, so we're going to put, ooh, it smells beautiful. I like the smell of it. Okay, so we're going to put that in there, and we are going to bring that up 
to a boil. I'm sorry. Uh, sugar first. Is it? Oh, yep, your pectin. Which um, which one did you want me to use? You can use the ball if you want, six tablespoons. This one? Or you can use a, a package of the cran gel. Okay, so we do have various kinds of pectin. This recipe calls for powdered pectin. Um, this is a ball product that you measure out. Um, and some of the other ones, there's liquid pectin, there's low sugar pectin. Okay, so we are going to use six tablespoons. Just the same thing as a, as a box, the other box. Okay. And yes, I have to think when I do this because, you know, I don't want to miss a count here. That's four. Five. And six. And this is the regular classic pectin um, that we're using. It back over here. And we do have our burner on high because we want to bring this up to a boil. Make sure that pectin is all dissolved, stirred in. Oh, yeah, I'll add the lemon juice at this time, too. And this is a half a cup of lemon juice. And like Sheila mentioned, the lemon juice is going to bring up the pH value of that wine, which is important when you're water bath canning anything, because it needs to be um, high acid, so we want that, that acid level up higher. And a quick question came in from YouTube right now. Is sure. there a time you recommend powder versus liquid uh, pectin or vice versa? Yeah, that's going to depend on the recipe. Um, because when you're doing these, when you're doing a jam or jelly recipe that, that um, involves pectin, the recipe will be specific to a pectin type. So if the recipe says to use liquid, use liquid. If it says to use powdered, then you can use any of the different kinds of powder, whether you use it in the box, which is one use, or if you use the multi-use jar, which you measure out the six tablespoons. So the recipe um, will dictate which one that you use, um, because if you try to do, like say it's a, um, a jam recipe, and the recipe calls for liquid, but you have powdered, if you use powdered, it, it, you're gonna probably not get the same results as that recipe was tested for, and so it's best to use what the recipe calls for. So make sure before you're buying all your ingredients that you read through your recipe and you know what it's calling for. So while we're ready, waiting for that to come up to a boil, I'll go ahead and advance the slides. So the steps to preserving jams and jellies are, first of all, we prepared our canner, we filled it with water at least halfway up. We preheated it to about 180 degrees. We inspected the jars. I washed them yesterday to make sure there were no defects, any cracks or chips. Um, and we uh, sterilized them by giving them a good boil. Um, actually, that sterilization is not important in Colorado because almost everywhere in Colorado, we're high enough in altitude that we're going to process anything for a minimum of 10 minutes. So we don't have to do the sterilization part here. So that's, that's a great thing about altitude. Um, so, we brought that up. We have our jars already in the canner warming because the last thing we want is a cold glass jar to put hot boiling liquid inside of it. We could have thermal shock, which would break the jar and we don't want that. So there were, our jars are warming up in here to about 180. We're not bringing it to a boil yet. So then we're going to follow the recipe instructions for preparing either the fruit or the juice. I um, mean, cooking it the way that it recommends. And in this case, we're using a powdered pectin. So we dissolve the pectin in the juice, or in this case, wine, first with the lemon juice. 
um, to make the pH go. It's actually higher in acid, but when we talk about pH, actually high acid is a lower number. It's counterintuitive, I know, but that's the way it is. So follow the recipe exactly as it is called for. So in this case, we are using a bottle, 750 milliliters of um, the red wine, which measures out about three and a quarter cup. If you've got box wines, which often I have at my house, some leftover box wine from a party, make sure the alcohol content on that wine isn't too high because if it's too high, you will not get a gel formation. So you want anything between a 12 and a 15. And I think Mary had said hers was 13. If it's higher than 15, what you want to do is simmer it for three minutes to drive off some of that alcohol. Then you're going to measure it back out again. And you want that three and a quarter cups, which of course it will have reduced in volume as well. So you're going to add back in water to bring it up to that or add in some juice. Are you ready for us to look at your camera? Okay. Uh, we, actually have a, we actually have a quick question. Uh, can you use hard cider instead of wine? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So let's go back to Mary's camera there. So we're at a boil and I'm going to add in the sugar all at once, all at once. And then we're going to whisk, whisk, whisk. Because we want that sugar to dissolve. The higher the temperature, the better. And we have 1300 BTUs on this one. Another question. Uh, any other good ways to heat jars? How do you feel about the dishwasher or the oven? Perfect. Dishwasher. Leave it in there. If they've run through the cycle, uh, leave them in there. The oven's great too. Okay, so now we need to wait for this to come back up to a boil. Okay, so when it comes, just signal me. And in the meantime, I'll move on with the slides. <coughs> so when you're making red wine jelly, this one is going to make about six, eight ounce jars. I'm stingy when it comes to gifts. So oftentimes I make this into 12, four ounce jars. The little small gift jars, because I don't want to give away too much. But in this case today, we're doing the eight ounce jars. Whenever you look at a recipe and it says six jars, eight jars, whatever it is, always know that that's not an exact science, depending upon evaporation of your ingredients and that sort of thing. So be prepared with an extra. I have um, six jars in there, plus I have one small one in case we need it. And when you go to fill the jar, if you don't have enough to actually fill it up to within a quarter inch of its headspace for jams and jellies, that one we may not process. We'll just put it in the refrigerator and we'll use it first. So in this case, we used three and a quarter cups of the dry red wine at room temperature. We added a half a cup of bottled lemon juice, not hand squeezed because lemons, depending on where they were grown, how they were harvested, how old they were in the store before you bought them and you squeeze them out, the pH isn't the same. But bottled lemon juice has a very consistent pH level to it. You could use lime juice as well if you didn't want to use lemon juice. And, and one package of the powdered pectin, and in ball that equals six tablespoons of the bulk. But that's not always true for every brand. So you might want to just start with a package, a box, and you know exactly how much is in there. So one box of the pectin, and this one called for four cups of sugar. Seems like a lot. It is. It's a very sweet jelly. Uh, super quick question from uh -huh. California. Um, any modifications for altitude beyond the sterilization you just mentioned? Right. So this jelly itself, it, the only a modification is, yes, you're going to have to sterilize your jars when you're closer to sea level first before you get started, is the final processing time. So all canning books are written for sea level. Anytime the processing time in your hot water bath or boiling water bath canner, same name, back and forth, um, if it under 20 minutes, you're going to add one minute per thousand feet above sea level that you live. But if it starts out at 20 minutes or above, you're going to add two minutes for every thousand feet. So since this one is closer to a 10 minute um, process, we're just going to add six minutes here. We're, you know, in Centennial, Colorado, 5280 is Denver. I'm just going to round it up 
rather than under processed for any reason, up to 6,000. So we're going to add six minutes to our processing time, which you would do it exactly as the book or the instructions say. Okay, this is starting to boil, but it's not at a rolling boil yet. So I don't know if you want to switch over so they can see this where it's just starting to boil. So don't start your time yet. Right, don't, don't um, start it yet because I can still stir it and it goes away. And so you want it to be at a, a hard enough boil that when I stir it, it keeps boiling. And we're nearly there. So you let me know when you're there and I will start a timer for you for two minutes. And I've also been going around the sides to make sure there's not sugar or pectin stuck to the sides. Oh, you're steaming up the camera, huh? <laughs> okay, I think that we are now at a rolling boil that when I stir it, it's still actively boiling. Okay, I just started your time for two minutes. One tip that I have is oftentimes jellies or jams will foam up, and I think strawberry jam is the one that's the worst for foaming. But when I've made this wine jelly before, oftentimes it'll foam. But if I use a silicon spoon, or in this case, she's got a nylon whisk, um, somehow this knocks the foam down. Um, some people put a little tiny bit, like a, maybe a half a teaspoon of butter in there, just a little bit of that fat will calm the foam down a little bit. But I have found these silicon spatulas, or in this case, she's using a nylon whisk, also help. So this two minutes of a hard boil is important because if you don't do it long enough, it will affect your gel. You might not get a gel set, um, which means that you have a syrup instead of a jam or a jelly. And again, that's one of those things that happens in high elevation a lot where it, uh, it needs that full time on the hard boil. And this is activating the pectin. You have about 30 seconds left. I can smell it. Wish we had smell-o-vision. Can you smell it out there? And it's also yeah. reduced nicely. Yeah. And it's starting to stick to the edges, so I know it's getting thicker. Uh, another question that just came in. Uh, can you use white wine or rosé? Yes. yes. The only problem with white wine, you can even do champagne. The only problem with white wine is once it gets in the jar, um, you don't see much. It's not that pretty. So you'll notice in your recipe pack, I've taken some um, white wine and I've combined it with some pomegranate juice because that's also high in acid um, to make a nice pretty color. Okay, so you're done with your two minutes. Do you have any foam, Mary? I do not have foam. Woohoo! So we're going to skip the part where you skim off the foam because we don't have any this time. Yeah, I know how to use my phone. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pull this off while the burner should be done. We'll leave it there for now. Okay, so a wider shot would probably be better now. And so the hot jars are in here with the hot water. When I take the lid off, I'm going to make sure I don't give myself a steam bath. So I'm going to open it away from myself. This is a jar lifter, our first tool of the night. So I'm going to dump out the hot water. Can we do them one at a time today? Take them all out. Whatever you'd rather do. I'll take them all out. Okay. If you're doing a lot, you would do just a few at a time so that your jars don't cool off. But we're not doing that many tonight, so we can pull them all out and fill them all at the same time. That and I have two ladles. <laughs> Expecting me to help you or something? Sure. Okay. All right.
Okay. And we've got one little one in here in case we in case we need it. In case we need it. Okay, put this back over here. Okay. Somewhere. You're good. And hmm. I'm going to can this go on the counter? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now she's got a ladle and she's going to put the hot jelly into these hot jars using a funnel. And this is the second tool of the night. <laughs> it's a canning funnel. So it has a nice wide bottom on it and it sits right over the jars very nicely. Let's see. Both of those I would say are essential equipment that you need. And yes, I remembered my apron tonight because I'm messy. I am messy. And I would end up wearing it. And since it's red wine, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go back and adjust the headspace in a minute, but this will be a good start here. Oh, that's a little full. Joanne Littell just joined us in the audience. Joanne is a cottage food producer here in Colorado, and she makes and sells wine jelly a lot. And um, I had the conversion of six tablespoons of pectin per box, and that's for ball. But Joanne, have you experienced a different conversion rate for different brands? Um, or different brands, and I... There's one that I bought on the internet, and for the life of me, I cannot remember, but it comes in 10 pound bags. Um, I tried te uh, six tablespoons tablespoons mm -hmm. with the last batch that I did, and it came out rather soupy. Okay. So I'm going to try eight. Okay. And if that doesn't work, I will not use it again. Um, I will go back to ball or the other one, the mm -hmm. sure gel. Okay. Which so I found every different. brand has a little bit different. Yeah. Yes. Every brand does. There. This one in front in the middle. Okay. So I don't know if which camera we're on, but you can see in the pan how it's starting to gel. I'll switch. There you go. And it does that. Can you see that how it's starting to gel already? That's a good sign. Mm -hmm. it means I need to move a little quicker though. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> okay, I'll be the sous chef that uh, takes your dishes, your dirty dishes, if you want to free the bubbles and adjust the headspace. Okay. Take, that. take the sticky. Okay, so the next tool is a bubbler that we're going to use. And this is to make sure that we don't have any air bubbles in here. And you know what? I need to adjust my headspace here a little bit. So I'm going to take some out of this one and put in that one. Because it's just a little shy over there. Something else sticky. Okay, so we're going to put this in here and we're going to run it around the edge. Um, you can use anything. You can use a chopstick. Um, you don't necessarily have to buy this tool. Uh, what you don't want to use is a metal butter knife. You could use a plastic one, um, but the reason you don't want to use metal is because it could chip or scratch the inside of your jar, and you don't want any um, scratches or nicks in the jar that you can't necessarily see. So it's best if it, when you're doing the debubbling that it's not metal. Uh, question I just came to, uh, can you add additional technique to process uh, the batch? There, reprocess. Yeah, there are directions for that. And if you download that fact sheet that they should have a link to, it tells you how to reprocess because it's adding more sugar, adding more lemon juice, adding more pectin, recooking it. All, all of those things have to happen. Okay. So the next step is to wipe the rims because I'm messy, <laughs> but also because um, – if there's anything on like on these, you'll see that there are, or I don't know if you can see or not. Anyway, there is some little drips for me debubbling or, you know, when I poured it in. Or when I pulled up the, the funnel. And so we need to make sure that that's a clean rim. It's also an excellent way to um, 
Where are the lids at? They're in that bowl. Oh, sorry, right in front of my and face. And those those lids, I did wash them in warm soapy water. They're not hot. If you ever can before, you remember years ago, you had to keep the lids simmering in simmering water. Um, the manufacturer Kerr and Ball, they're the main manufacturers of these two-part lids. They did a re-chemical formulation on those rubber gaskets that you do not need to keep them hot anymore. You can put them on at room temperature, but do wash them with soap and water first in case there's any kind of film on them from manufacturing. And these are just pieces of paper towel that are wet um, just to make sure that I can, you know, get any, any of the sticky gel off of there. Um, you could also use uh, white vinegar if you prefer. Um, I just, I'm cheap, so I just use water. And a paper towel that's torn into pieces. Um, so this step's important. So if there's any food product on there, it will inhibit the seal. And so we want to make sure that, that we have good seals. Okay, so, and these are a one-time use um, lid. You cannot reuse them. But can you reuse the rings? Yes, you can reuse the rings. Explain fingertip tight there, Mary. Okay, so the rings need to be on fingertip tight. What you do not want to do is crank it down there as strong as you can. So what I do is I gently put my finger on the center. I don't want to push it down. I'm just holding it there. And I get the ring started. Sometimes it takes me a minute. And I spin it until I hear it catch. And that's it. Okay, so if I just go like that. So it's just just catching. That's one of the, the mistakes that people make is they crank that on there too tightly. And then, they, then their lid will buckle when it's in the water bath canner. And we don't want buckled lids because that means you don't have a good seal. Okay, one more. Okay, we are good to go. So, I see a spot of jelly. <laughs> Sticky. <laughs> okay, okay, jar lifter. Now we're going to put these back into the water bath canner. The water needs to be two inches above the top of the jar. And you'll see air coming out as you put them in, and that's okay. There is a rack in the bottom of this, so it's not sitting on the bottom. You do that and I'm gonna end up dropping one. And that's Mary's hair. Okay, put that in. See there's little bubbles that are coming out of that one, that's okay. And then put the little one in. Okay. So in this one, we ended up with five jars and a baby jar, five, eight ounce and a baby jar. Yep. So, so now we're going to crank this up to boil. We're going to put this particular um, electric bath, bath canner has you put um, a rack on the top of them when they're in there. And so I'm going to put that rack in there. It helps hold them, don't you think? It does. It keeps them from tipping over. I'm going to put this on there. And when it comes up to a boil, then we're going to start our actual processing time. Right. So when it comes back to a boil, a full rolling boil, we will bring the camera back over so you can see what that looks like. Um, and then we'll we'll start the processing time. So I'm going to go through the slides again. And I'm going to wash my hands because I'm sticky. All right. <laughs> so Mary removed it from the heat. She did not have to skim off any foam. Joanne, are you finding foam when you do wine jelly? Sometimes, but very, very rarely. Right. More with other fruits, I think. Oh, definitely. Do you think strawberry is the worst? Yes. Yes, I do too. And I don't have to get rid of it. Right. Right. So we want a quarter inch headspace, and that headspace is the top of the rim down to the top of the jelly. And Mary had a great um, tool um, that she could measure that with, or you can just use a ruler. And so remove, she removed the bubbles and adjusted the headspace if she needed to. She used a wet paper towel to wipe off the jar rim. Any residue will get in the way of the seal. And then she centered it on there. The the, the one part lit the uh, this, well the part the one 
use lid and then put the ring down, fingertip tight. When her fingertips stopped rotating with it, she stopped. And then she placed them down into the canner um, very slowly, upright the whole time. And you need to make sure there's enough hot water in the canner so that it covers the jars one to two inches above the tops. So it's always a good idea to have a pot of extra water or an electric kettle going so that you can add hot water. You don't want to add cold water to this process. And as you pour it in to make that one to two inches, make sure you're not pouring it right on the jar. So it's around the jars. Aha, question. Uh -huh, question. The question is, is about lids. Mm -hmm. And they want to know about the, the brand Pure P-U-R um, because I can't find ball or cur. Um, and if you've heard or know anything about that. I think you know that, Mary. <laughs> Mary, can you answer that question? I don't have personal experience using per um, using the per lids. Um, however, I have heard anecdotally from other canners that they're not liking them. They're having troubles with them. Um, they're having troubles with them buckling um, as well as not sealing. And as expensive as the, the lids are right now, um, you know, having a lid failure can be expensive. It can add up. Um, so I would, you know, be cautious of it. I've heard also some issues with some other generic ones or ones from other countries and or like no label ones from, you know, online and stuff. Um, so I would stick to a brand that you're familiar with if you can get them. Um, I have been seeing them in our local stores. Um, primarily, though, it's been hardware stores, um, the big box stores, the tractor supply stores, or like farm and home type mm -hmm. stores. I've seen them more there than I have at the grocery store. The grocery store shelves are still pretty, pretty bare. Pretty bare. Um, the other thing is, is I've noticed that it's easier to buy a case of jars that come with the lids and rings than to just buy the rings so or the um lids. or the lids so um i can never have too many jars mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, i'm okay buying a whole new case okay so okay so uh, then you place them in the canner question uh, how do you know if your cider or wine has the right acidity to be similar to how about tomatoes and rice okay so tomatoes are less acidic than fruit actually so you always have to have lemon juice. And hopefully one of the handouts that you got and you can download talks about the different pH of different juices. So apple juice is between 3.35 and 4. Um, and for a good gel, we need something between 3 and 3.2. So for apple juice, it's not quite acid enough. You're going to have to add the lemon juice to it to make a good apple jelly or apple cider jelly okay so you can use this handout to um, help you with that yes joanne what do you do if you have um, used a 16 ounce jar in the canner with three other eight ounce jars using the water right but it has to be higher than the tallest one, right? And then you could take some of the smaller ones out earlier and leave the 16 one in there for longer. But most of the time we just say, you have to follow the processing time for the largest jar. That's probably the best and easiest way to do it. But the water has to be one to two inches above the tallest jar. Good question. All right, so we have the lid on. It's um, coming up to heat, not quite there yet. So this is for sea level. Process 10 minutes at sea level plus one minute for every thousand feet above sea level. So we're going to round that up to six minutes. We're going to process these for 16. So write that down on your piece of paper because your altitude might be different. Once we process for 16 minutes, then we're going to turn off the heat, remove the lid, and wait five minutes before we take them out of the canner. Is the question? Yeah, uh, just going back to the acidities, how do you measure the acidity? You could get a digital pH meter to measure the acidity. Those meters, though, it's just not a matter of buying the meter and sticking it in your food. You have to buy a special solution to soak the tip in, 
then you have to buy solutions that you put it in that are both above and below the pH that you want to read. And we have to buffer or calibrate those every time you use it. But if you want information about different meters that are out there for food, what you need to buy, how much they cost, and how to calibrate them, go out on your um, search engine to Wisconsin, Wisconsin State University Extension and pH meters for food. And you'll find a great publication on that. It's University of Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin. Um, and they're around, you, what was it 50, 60? The meter itself was about $50. And then when we bought all of the buffering solutions and the cleaning and soaking solutions, it was over a hundred. So, okay. cause I bought three of them and it, I was thinking that I spent around but if you're really going to get into this and get scientific and techie about it, hey, get yourself a meter and you can check the pH of your different um, juice solutions. Uh, sorry, another mm -hmm. question. Are there acid sticks and uh, where do you get them? Uh, we don't recommend acid sticks. I don't think that they're, um, they're not accurate enough. Accurate enough, right. Or sometimes you can buy those rainbow, like, um, pH strips that they use in pools to see how much chlorine's in there with the bases. We don't recommend those either. Because what shade of orange? Right. Most of them, it's a, one of the <laughs> shades of orange that we're going for. And which exact shade is that? So a digital read is really important when you're processing foods because the reason 4.6 is so important is if we do not get 4.6 or below in the pH, and you put it in a hot water bath canner versus a pressure canner, we are at the risk of botulism. And folks, that is not 24 to 48 hours of vomiting and diarrhea. This is a neurotoxin that will stop your lungs from breathing. All of your organs will start to shut down. It can be deadly. And if it doesn't kill you, you might be disabled the rest of your life. So you really don't want that. This is a science, not so much an art of, if you're a cook, or a baker, you can get super creative and it can, that's great. But this is a science. There's science behind it. And if you start to get too creative outside that wheel, um, then it can get dangerous. Okay, so we're waiting for this to come up. And so we'll go back to the slides. So um, we're gonna process that for that 16 minutes here in Centennial, Colorado. Then we're gonna turn off the heat, wait, a turn, and take the lid off, wait five minutes, then we're gonna lift them out straight up. We're not gonna tilt them to get the water off the concave part of the lid. We're just straight out onto a towel. It has to be a dry towel. And if this one maybe got a little wet, we'll change it out. Um, or it's a wooden not wet, board. it's just sticky where I dripped. Oh, okay. Because it's, if this is wet, it's cold. You also don't wanna lift them out onto stone countertops like marble or granite because we could get thermal shock. shock. We don't want a hot jar on a cold surface. We want it either on a cooling rack, wood, a nylon cutting board is fine, or a dry towel, you can take them out. And then don't move them for 24 hours because that gel is still going to be set. After 24 hours, you're gonna go over to the jar. You're gonna make sure there's a seal on it, push down. This one's already down, it's not popping back up. I'm not hearing any movement here. Um, then you're going to take your ring off, wash both pieces, let them completely dry, and then put this one on, label it and put it on your shelf or put it in a gift basket. Once you learn this technique, you can do things like, this is applesauce, I have pepper jelly here, apple butter, uh, pickled, different vegetables in here, all kinds of great things that you can make and give to friends. I have a question for you. Yes. Do you store your jars in your pantry with the ring on or off? Technically, you're not supposed to. But Colorado's not very humid, so I don't I don't feel that there's a uh, an issue with rust developing underneath the ring, but technically you're not supposed to because also if something were to be growing in the jar, it might pop that lid off and I might not see that if I've got the ring on holding it down. So right. technically, no, you're not supposed to, but do I? Sometimes yes. Well, and I grew up in Iowa where the rings need to come off because of the humidity, number one. Mm -hmm. But also, if, until you've learned how to see and, and check your seals, 
um, you know, get some experience, mm -hmm. um, that ring off. If you have a lid failure, you will notice it. If the ring is on there, it could get a false seal um, and, and hold it in place when it really isn't sealed. So it is important to store them with the rings off until you know, you know what you're what you're doing. Okay. So back to the slides. This one's on high altitude, and we kind of covered this before. But if it's less than 20 minutes at uh, sea level, you add one minute per thousand feet. If it's more than 20 minutes, you add two minutes. If you don't know what your altitude is, there's a link where you can go out and find it, or you can go to Preserve Smart app. Or the website and you can also get a link there to find your altitude i believe we are boiling okay so let's switch to this camera and see what mm, not quite yet no uh, we're just still getting air bubbles it's driving air bubbles out it's not quite boiling yet so after the processing uh, for the recommended amount of time again we're going to wait that five minutes and then we're going to lift them out set them upright um, on a towel or cooling rack and leave them again that 12 to 24 hours, not retightening the bands, leave the bands alone. Then we're gonna check to make sure we have a seal by pushing it in on the middle and make sure it doesn't spring back up. Um, look at it, you can also look at it at eye level and make sure you've got a little bit of a dip, a little concave there in the center. Uh, question, mm -hmm. what if you don't have a canning rack for your pot? Is there something else that someone Sure, use? absolutely. So what you could do, I use, is, I use a hot pad holder. I have a big one and I have set that in there on the bottom or a tea towel. Mm -hmm. I've taken yes. foil and made a snake out of it. Yep. Along Roll up aluminum foil. Or you can take a bunch of the bands off of your jars that you um, already did or some extra ones and you can twist tie them together with those bread twist ties to make a little trivet that goes in the bottom. Or these big round ones, I've even found some round uh, cooling racks that I can put down in there. Anything to keep the jar off the bottom and the water circulating around and underneath at the same time. Try the hardware store in the barbecue area. Good idea, Joanne. I found two of them. The and round racks. A round rack mm -hmm. fit in the canner. There we go. Okay, so now let's take a look. You ready for this camera? Uh, is it ready yet? It's not boiling yet when I take the lid off. Okay, what is it? It's up. It's up. It's almost there. Let's get I thought there. I heard it jiggling. I know, wash pots never boil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the slide. So you're going to remove the band after that 24 hours. Clean the jars because oftentimes a little bit of jelly will come out and be sticky on the outside. <laughs> or in this office, we have super hard water. So I might have mineral deposits on the outside of the jar. So I'm going to clean the jars really well and I'm going to label the contents. Although I know what all of these jars are, um, in a couple of years they may have changed color or I don't remember exactly what I did. So label them with what's in there and how you process them. So in case later on you're like, did I make the altitude adjustment? Are these safe to eat? You can look at the label and know exactly what you did and that they are safe. And then store them in a cool, dry place and they're best used um, within a year because they will start to change color and the nutrient levels go down. Not that they will make you sick as far as bacteria and that sort of thing, but the nutrient level, the flavor, the texture, the color all diminish. Yes, Joy. Before you put your jars in the canner, um, what is your feeling on adding some vinegar to the water to keep it from staining so much, staining the jar lids? Right, that is a recommendation that you add, if, particularly if you have hard water, that you add some vinegar to it. And the exact amount, I'm not, a splash, a splash of vinegar. Splash. Yeah, and it helps the, yeah. <laughs> it helps the. Yeah, I mean, seriously, that's all you need is just a splash. Okay. So. Thank you. Sure. It's getting close, you guys. Not quite there yet. So back to the, the slides. Tips for success. When you prepare your soft spreads, do it in small batches. Don't say, oh, well, that was fun, but I wish I could have done two or three batches at the same time. Um, it'll take less. When you start doing that, it takes longer for your product to come up to heat 
and the pectin starts to denature. So you will not get the same gel. So it's important to do smaller batch. But if you look at some of the jars of the classic pectin in the bulk, you'll also find that they have smaller batches to begin with. And you can triple and almost quadruple those because they were smaller to begin with. But a traditional full box of pectin, do one at a time unless you're very experienced and you know how to do it. And you've got a lot of BTUs, a lot of heat. Otherwise, you'll denature that uh, pectin and you won't get the gel that you want. Also, measure your ingredients accurately um, and do not reduce any of your ingredients. If you want a lower sugar jam or jelly, make sure you get the appropriate pectin for low sugar because it is formulated chemically a little differently for low sugar. Um, rapidly boil. Bring it out. So the slow boil destroys the pectin. I said that. Uh, and you must be processed in a boiling water bath canner and follow the instructions. Okay, so let's take a look. Is it ready yet? Gosh darn it. I don't think that's boiling yet. Okay, so let's go on to the six basic kinds of spreadable fruit. We've got jellies, and you know what that is. It's usually clear, and if you were to cut it, um, it would have separate sides to it, almost like the with the Red Sea parting or whatever, which you, you cut down it, it will stay separate and then just slightly start to move in toward each other. Marmalades are usually made from the rinds of different types of um, citrus fruits, whether it's oranges, lemons, limes, tangerines, grapefruit, that sort of thing. And most of the pectin actually comes from the rind rather than adding your own pectin. Conserves, um, that's a different type of uh, product and it usually has some nuts in it. It's usually some sort of bigger piece of fruits um, almost like a jam, but a little bit bigger pieces of fruit, and it usually has some sort of nuts or sometimes even coconut in it. Butters are smooth, almost like an applesauce, but a little bit thicker and usually spiced in some way. And then preserves are whole pieces of fruit. Usually, like, you'll find strawberry preserves, whole small strawberries in there, or whole pieces of blueberry, that sort of thing, whereas jams are more mashed fruit. So that's the difference between those. So the four basic ingredients that are common in all fruit spe spreads are fruit, the pectin, the sugar, and the acid. So the fruit, you can use wine or canned frozen juice, but pectin always has to be added to there. But by the time you make juice out of some sort of fruit, all the pectin is, is not there. Um, so fruit should be just at the right stage for the best color and flavor. Although if you put a couple of a little bit underripe fruits in, they have a little bit more pectin in them. Make sure your fruit was fresh, free from damage or decay. It doesn't have to be a perfect size because you're going to chop it up. So that's fine. And if you use canned or frozen uh, fresh or, or fresh fruits, uh, you might be able to do that if there's something not available. Like I often make, this happens to be habanero gold, which is a hot um, habanero pepper in with dehydrated um, apricots in a gel base. So I can do that even in the winter when I don't have fresh fruits. Um, pectin, very important for the gel. It causes those juices to gel up. And some fruits like apples, lemon, blackberries can, can, can contain enough. Um, it, now we are at a rolling boil. So let me... 16 minutes. 16 minutes. Here we go. That's what a rolling boil looks like. Are you fogging up yet? Okay, so we're going to put the lid back on and we're going to time that for 16 minutes. So back to the slides. Um, so commercial pectin is made from apples and citrus fruit primarily. So it is a natural product. It's not a chemical like lab made product. It actually comes from apples or citrus. And it's available in liquid, as Mary had said, and powdered form but they're not interchangeable. Because you noticed in this one, we dissolved the pectin in the wine or the juice first with the lemon juice uh, and brought it up and then we added the sugar. Whereas in the liquid, it's a different process and you get a little bit different gel in that as well. So follow the recommendations uh, for the recipe that you have. There's also low sugar or no sugar pectins and they gel a little differently as well. So make sure before you get started, 
that you've read all the instructions, you know what order you're adding things. One of them is calcium sets. You'll have to make this little calcium powder first and add it. So it is a little bit different. So this happens to be a jar of the ball classic. It's in bulk instead of in the individual boxes. So there's many different kinds that you can use. Um, the actual, the bulk one is scalable. It can make anywhere from one jar at a time up to 10 jars at a time in their recipe formulation. There's also Pomona's. This seems to be a favorite with folks that are doing a low sugar, but it is expensive. So those people like Joanne that are in business of making this may or may not choose Pomona because of its price, or she may be buying it in bulk. Um, so that's important to know. You can make some soft spreads without adding pectin. And this talks about the sheeting method coming off of the spoon um, in order to know whether it's going to gel once it's processed. And I've done this with strawberry jam before, and it does taste very cooked. We did an experiment here in the office where we did the cooked down, no pectin added, classic like grandma probably made, turned very dark, almost black looking, and it tastes very cooked. But that was a flavor profile that my grandmother and my mom liked because that was homemade. Um, whereas when you actually add pectin to it, you reduce the sugar and you don't cook it as long. And so you'll get a brighter, um, more strawberry flavor. And then the reduced sugar pectins, if you use those, we did experiment with them and we did some taste testing. Those that are the low sugar pectins that you add the maximum amount of sugar for that low sugar pectin, those taste the brightest. When you start going too low in the sugar, it becomes tart, but you don't get the sweetness of the fruit, as well as we found out the lower the sugar you go, the um, lower the shelf life is. So within three months, our no sugar strawberry jam turned the color of my skin beige. It was not appetizing at all. Adding a little bit more sugar actually helps preserve the flavor and the color in those. Yes, Joanne. So I live tall, which has been around for Ever. Mm -hmm. um, if that's used with pectin other than all, would that work? Would that work? Can we do it in cottage food or not do it in cottage food? In Colorado cottage food law, they're not right now allowing low sugar jams and jellies because the health department believes that that sugar in there is part of the pres uh, preservation. So they're not allowing it, although you can probably find directions for it. Some of those sweeteners, as you heat them up and process them like this in boiling water for 16 minutes, they turn bitter or they lose a lot of their sweetness. So you'll have to experiment with that. Find one that says low or no sugar on the pectin. It's not that one. Um, low or no sugar on it. And experiment and see if you like the flavor of it or not. People have had mixed results. Okay, so this slide talks about uh, for jams and jellies with no sugar, they tend to resemble more of a gelatin fruit rather than a jam or a jelly. Use a specific uh, recipe for the sweetener that you want to use. Uh, it may require one of those modified pectins. In fact, it will require a modified pectin, the low sugar pectins. Um, and some of them that USDA has called for actually unflavored gelatin, so you have to store them in the refrigerator. And it does feel and taste like you're spreading jello on your toast. So, you know, um, to each their own on that one. So to prevent storage, um, it requires a little bit longer processing time. And to prevent spoilage, it requires a longer processing time, but we've not found that it has a very good shelf life to retain color and flavor. Sugar, it's important in fruits, jams, and jellies. The proper amount is needed based on the pectin that you picked um, and the acid that you're going to put in there. So never reduce the amount unless on the pectin itself, itself it says you can. Uh, so you can make low or no sugar jams and jellies with those special pectins. Acids, they're needed to form the gel and the flavor, as well as it helps preserve some of the color as well. So the acid content varies among fruits. So if you follow the directions on the type of pectin that you got or one of your tested recipes, it'll tell you exactly how much bottled lemon juice to add 
based on the type of fruit you started with. You could also use citric acid as well instead of, or instead of lemon juice. My sister's allergic to all citrus, so I always do this. It doesn't work quite as well as far as flavor profile and as far as shelf life and retaining colors, but it is an acceptable um, substitute. So for every tablespoon of lemon juice that the recipe calls for, you could substitute an eighth of a teaspoon of citric acid that you dissolve into a tablespoon of water. Vinegar is called for instead of lemon juice in many of your more vegetable type of jams and jellies, such as onion jelly, pepper jelly, that sort of thing. They start with vinegar instead of lemon juice. So there are two methods of canning. Today we've gone over the water bath, hot water bath, or some people call it the boiling water bath method. This is only for foods that are the pH is 4.6 or below. We kind of explain that why. And that's your fruits, pickles, jams, jellies, and tomatoes with lemon juice added or citric acid. And then there's pressure canning. And in pressure canning, you can can meats, poultry, fish, milk, and vegetables. But a pressure canner has to be brought up to 240 degrees. Water boils here in Centennial about 202. So it requires the extra pressure to get it up. So on a gauge dial here in Centennial, it's closer to 13 pounds. And if I don't have a gauge dial, I might have a weighted gauge. So I'm gonna have to go up to 15 because those weights go five and 15. I'm gonna have to go up clear to the 15 to um, actually can any of those other higher food, higher pH foods to avoid any botulism. So processes that we do not recommend. We do not recommend opal, open kettle canning. A lot of our grandparents used to do this. Um, the temperatures in there are not hot enough. Open cattle canning is often pouring hot food into hot jars, putting the lid and the ring on and just letting them cool. There's no processing involved in that. Um, and they just threw the actual cooling of the product to get a vacuum seal. Great, it's vacuumed, but you did not sterilize or pasteurize the airspace in there and you did not drive out the air. So lots of problems can happen with that. The other one we don't recommend is steam canners. Although you can use them sometimes at sea level better than here, at our altitude, anything that you run a steam canner with for more than 20 minutes, you could run out of steam. And so you'd have to open it up, stop the process, add more water to create the amount of steam. We're just too dry here. So we don't usually recommend those. And definitely we never recommend canning in the oven, microwave, or dishwasher. An open kettle could be doing a water bath that you have to do. In some people's minds, yeah. And, and you have to have a lid on that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question, Corey? Yeah, we have two questions. Um, number one, can you use lime juice or other types of citrus juice? And then uh, I'll, I'll ask the second question. Okay, so if we look at the chart here, lemon is pH is between two and 2.35, lime is 2 to 2.8. So it's a it can be a little bit higher, but in most instances, you could substitute lime for lime. It belongs with bottle, not fresh. And then uh, can you use vinegar instead of lemon juice for candy? No. Uh, you'd have to use a lot more. You could, but it's like twice the amount. So download our fact sheet or look up on your Preserve Smart app or website that I just told you about tomatoes it will tell you how much lemon juice versus citric acid versus vinegar. But by the time twice as much vinegar as lemon juice in that jar, people can taste it. Yeah, whereas you don't taste it as much with lemon juice. So I, I wouldn't recommend it. Are we at time yet? No, we've got five minutes. Okay. All right, next slide is freezer jams and jellies. So you're gonna use the recipe specific for freezer jams and jellies. It's a different kind of pectin. Um, it's, so it's not any of these others, it's for, specifically for freezer. What you do is you mash your fruit up, you add either your lemon juice or whatever it calls for, and the amount of sugar it calls for, you're adding your pectin. You're letting it sit on the counter, sometimes 12 to tw uh, 24 hours to set up, and then you're storing it in the refrigerator or the freezer. Oh my gosh, this tastes the closest to fresh fruit you've probably ever had. Uh, but it takes up freezer space. So uh, that's a possibility, but it's a different type of pectin. Um, and you, again, you have to store it in your refrigerator and freezer. 
So when you're ready to get started, make sure you review tested, reliable recipes and instructions. And we say tested, we don't mean the chef at the local restaurant tested it and it tastes great. We mean it's been tested. The science of it has been tested in a lab. We know what the pH is. We know what the viscosity, how thick that item is, and we know how long it takes to get the heat to penetrate all the way to the center of the size of the jar you're using with the viscosity of the food that you have and what its pH is. All those things are involved in that science. So selected, um, select fresh recipes or re select reviewed and tested recipes, use fresh ingredients, plan your time wisely because you could be in the middle of something you didn't realize it was going to take so long to heat up and then you have to go get the kids at the bus stop or whatever it is. Plan a lot of extra time, assemble your equipment, pre-measure your ingredients, and that's kind of the recipe for success there. So reliable canning resources are from CSU Extension. You can go on the uh, Farm to Table website. Best place though is that Preserve Smart app and website. You can put in your search engine, State University Extension, and whatever you're looking for. Saskatoon jam, let's say. Uh, Colorado probably doesn't have a tested recipe for Saskatoon berry jam, but Alaska probably does. Um, most of the Ball Blue books that were written after 1994 are pretty good because we changed how much acid you have to add to tomatoes in 1994. The Ball Complete book of home preserving is also good. The University of Georgia Extension put out So Easy to Preserve. That's a great one. And then the National Center for Home Food Preservation has a website there. The link is there. Um, and you can download their entire seven chapter book on food preservation or home canning, and it gives you everything from how does all this work with diagrams, jams, jellies, all the way up to canning meats and fishes. Uh, and then also, if you're doing jams and jellies, look at the directions on your pectin. So here's the equipment that we use today, hot water bath canner with a lid. As we said before, Mary's using the electric one. You can also use one that you put on your stove We've got an old-fashioned enamel one over there. I would caution you that if you've got a smooth top, ceramic um, stove top, be careful because sometimes the manufacturers will not warranty your glass top. If the size of your canner sits two inches outside of the heating room because you're going to transfer heat over to an area of the stove um, that's not thermal shock protected as well, then you could crack the top. So gas works really well. Uh, sometimes those electric coils work well on a flat bottom canner, but on one like this old fashioned enamel one, the canner itself has got ridges. So this one isn't going to work too well on a coil electric. It's going to work better on gas. The equipment that we also have here today are Mary used a funnel. We had a timer on our phones. She had the two piece lids, which is the lid and the rings. We had lots of clean cloths and towels. Um, she happened to use a bubble freer, which is very similar to a plastic knife or a chopstick. We have a jar lifter. It used to be you needed a jar wand, which I think we put away. Oh, here we go. This is a jar wand, because I mean a lid wand. Uh, and it used to be you had to have, remember those lids boiling, simmering? You couldn't put your fingers in there. So you'd grab with this magnet the lids out of the steamy hot water and put it on. But now that we don't have to boil them, uh, I don't know what people are gonna do with it, but we'll find something we can do with this magnetic wand. Um, a jelly bag, if you're actually going to stomp your own grapes and squeeze your own juice out of the grapes, let's say you might need a jelly bag. A cutting board only if you're cutting up uh, your fruits or vegetables to put in there and hot pads. We do not recommend sealing jam and jelly jars with paraffin anymore. I grew up, that's what we did. We um, heated up the paraffin, melted it, and we poured it over the jars of the strawberry jelly. And after about, about maybe every five jars, when I would push down on that paraffin to lift it up, there was mold under there. But my mom always said, no problem, just scrape it off. But we've now found that the mold, the fingers of the mold go farther into the jam or jelly than we can see with our eyes. And those mold spores and some of the toxins that they create where they grow can be carcinogenic. So I wouldn't recommend that. 
Also, don't use any of the zinc caps with the rubber ring, uh, rings. Glass lids with rubber rings are also not great because they fail. Oh, are we up time? Yep, I just turned it off. Okay, so we'll go back to this, and we'll put on another timer now. I'll take the lid off. Now notice, I'm going to do this away from my face and set the timer for five minutes. Got to hang over the camera down. Whoop, get steam on there. <laughs> Hmm. This is gonna hurt. No, don't do that. Just let it sit for five minutes. I'll take the rack out. Oh, you're gonna take the rack out? So you can the see. upper rack. A lot of canners don't use this upper rack. Okay, no, I'm not. It's very hot. <laughs> no. And it's while really while hot. Mary's waiting the five minutes, I will show you this is a different type of jar lifter. This is my favorite. It has a spring-loaded latch to it. And I'm going to be using my hand on this part, and this part down here is on the jar. Here is a different type, the type most people have. And I have seen some professional chefs on TV using them upside down, picking up the jar with the handle. And it just, it's not very stable. So make sure that you've got these roller handles in your hands and it's the rubber part that actually you can't get it this part goes together this part does not come all the way together that's the part that goes down on the jar national tv was using her jar lifter upside down oh that's thank fun. you oh joanne you're thank so you. smart she's so smart well, she found it. a ladle handle to lift up that top wrap very good. And one of them fell over, and that happens occasionally. We'll leave, just tip it right back up. That particular rack um, does not have any holes or indentations for the jars in it. It's just flat. So you will have a little bit more of that possibility of it falling over. Whereas I prefer a rack like this. Um, it holds it a little bit better, and I can get a hold of it sticking up above the water. And some racks actually even have a divider in the middle, a little bit more seated for your jars, and they don't fall over quite as much. Okay, two minutes and we can take them out. Okay. And the purpose for waiting is so that you don't get burnt. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> so you don't get burnt, and we don't have a thermal shock either. Uh -oh. Yeah. Right, so you know when it's thermal shock because the bottom literally blows out of the jar. And you, then you have hot boiling contents everywhere. And oh. yes, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you don't want to have that happen because it's not safe. And that's the same reason why when we pull them out and put them on this towel, we don't want to do that near like an open window because a cool wind or rain or something, whatever the weather's doing outside, could also thermal shock them. Um, you might have, you know, heard stories of, you know, canning mishaps. And a lot of times that's wise because people put them near a window thinking it would cool them down quicker. And what it really did was cause thermal shock. Mm -hmm. so. so this is also another type of jar that you do not want to use. This one happens to be from Ikea, but there's other places that sell them. This is great for storing flour, sugar could become canisters. I've got sugar in here with some dried lavender, making lavender sugar then to bake with later mm -hmm. in the year once it's finished um, infusing the sugar. And this might have been in the 1800s what Napoleon or something else did canning with, but this is not appropriate for canning today. The science of it, it just does not do well. Corey. Uh, what is the benefit of the upper rack in the canner? Uh, could you stack two tiers of jars if they are fully submerged? Mm -hmm. Yes. So those little four ounce jars, perfect for that. Putting that in between and then stacking another layer of four ounce. Right. And I don't use that top rack when I'm doing it on the stove top. Um, but this particular device um, tells you that you should in here use it. And so... Because of the instructions say to do that, that's why we do that. Um, and again, it just kind of stabilizes them a little bit to make sure that you don't get one that's, you know, rolling over or floating or, you know, doing something weird. Um, but normally when I do it on the stovetop, I don't use a top rack. I just use the bottom rack. 
Okay, 12 seconds. 12 seconds. So, I'm going to use Sheila's favorite ones. Straight up and out. There is water on the top of the jar, but she's not going to tip it. It'll evaporate. Yes, what a lot of people like to do is they pull it up and they tip, and you don't want to do that. Because some of your product could then seep under the lid while it's still cooling. And the bands are much looser now than they were when I put them in because, of course, they got hot and they expanded. They jiggled, too. So don't readjust them. Don't tighten them. Yep, don't tighten them down yet. Oh, I heard a ping. Oh, another one. It's a very subtle sound. These two go right up against each other. Sometimes that one, because it's thick, I use this one with the for too close to the edge. Oh. These are almost pinging as we bring them out. When we say ping, it's that suck in of the metal as it's starting to create the vacuum. Some of them will do it as you lift them out. Others, not so much. I don't know if anyone can see the button on this one. Can you show this button? It's still up. Can you see that little bit of concave? It's still up, it hasn't sucked in yet. You can still see a little bit of a nipple or a button there. Whereas this one over here, you cannot see it. it's already sucked down. So we're gonna let these sit for 12 to 24 hours. Before we take the rings off, check the seals, separate the ring from it, wash them, label them. Sometimes you can see the actual product boiling. This might be too dark to actually see it, but the contents in there, trust me, is boiling. <laughs> so that is the end of the presentation, the demonstration, as well as the PowerPoint. So we're here to answer any questions that people have. I honestly think you answered pretty much all the questions as we were going as the along. Presentation was going on, so. Okay. I hope you try it because it's really good. Um, Joanne sells a lot of wine jelly. So I'm going to ask Joanne, uh -oh. what is your favorite wine to make wine jelly out of that customers really like? I use, um, <laughs> put me on the spot. It's a Cabernet Shiraz blend. Okay. It is from Cowboy, Cowboy. And the reason I chose it, uh, not knowing what would happen way back when I first started, was the story on the back of the bottle, ah, <laughs> on the back label. <laughs> and it talked about um, how the miners used to come to the vineyards after they were finished working and they would help s smash the grapes. Mm -hmm. And they would go home with Purple cowboy, purple feet. <laughs> I I'm home with purple feet and somewhat drunk. <laughs> and I figured for 10 bucks, I could give it a, a try. I give it a try. <laughs> and it worked and it has worked for six years. Yeah. And they love it. And it has won many awards. Yes. And it's great. <laughs> I wouldn't pay over $10 a bottle for something that I'm going to make jelly out of. That's my personal. Vent on it. Plus, if you have box wine, sometimes if we have a party at my house, we might have a box of red and a box of white. We've got a little bit of leftover. I like to mix it together till it looks pretty. And then I make wine jelly out of that. So I was asked, why? What, how are you going to eat this? What do you like with it? And for me personally, I like it on a toasted bagel with cream cheese ah. and a little bit of wine jelly. It's pretty yummy. Yes, Corey. Um, I do have a question from YouTube. Uh, do you wipe off the water on the top of the jars after taking them out? No, not until no. it's set for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow um, evening, we'll come in here and if there's still water on it, then we can take a paper towel and blot it. Um, but we wanna leave them undisturbed for 24 hours. Yeah, if you were to blot it up now, you could accidentally push down that button and have a false seal, which you don't want. Yes, Joanne. Because our water is so hard, I have found that it leaves a water ring mm -hmm. on the top of the jars, which makes it look very ugly mm -hmm. <laughs> when you want to sell it. How do you get that water ring out? off? Well, with a little bit of vinegar. Vinegar, I'd say vinegar, vinegar and water, paper towel. Paper towel. Oh, yeah, when okay, they're completely dry. 
I have cheated and just put a paper towel up against the water, not push down, but just yeah, just, just, just yeah. get a little bit of a siphoning thing going there. <laughs> but being very careful that I'm not actually pushing down on the lid. Yes, I that I understand. The other way that Joanne serves her wine jelly when she's trying to sell it at shows, which is very popular, is a cracker and some brie cheese and some wine jelly. And oh my gosh, and she just sells out. <laughs> my my niece is in love with her wine jelly. In fact, we were at the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago. We had to get not one, but two jars of Joanne's wine jelly. Uh, okay, so we have we have three more questions online. Uh, number one, uh, should you cover the jars with the towel as they're cooling nope. for the 12 to 24 hours? Nope. Nope. Um, how long will this jelly keep, and is it best to store it in a cupboard or refrigerator, and how long will it uh, last once opened. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, Joanne says not long once you open it, you eat it. But um, seriously, we are supposed to use most jams and jellies within a year for best flavor um, and for the gel to still be there. But you could be long. I've got jars of, oh, here it is, one of them. Uh, and I opened one and put it in the refrigerator. After you open it, it should always go in the refrigerator. I made these in 2007, 2017. And I opened one and tasted it. It still has an alcohol um, wine flavor to it. It has darkened, so it has that little darker, almost tanniny flavor to it, almost like the difference between a grape and a raisin flavor, you know, that kind of metallic. Mm -hmm. um, but it is still edible. I wouldn't mind eating it. And the jar of the habanero gold, mm -hmm. um, I took a jar home just on Monday and my husband had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with that and loved it. This is at least two years old. And that one is also a couple years old. Um, so it still had the very nice pepper flavor, he said, um, which he, he thinks mixes quite well with peanut butter. <laughs> um, so these are shelf stable. And so you can keep them in your pantry. Uh, but once they're open, then it needs to go in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I got a couple more questions that came in too. Uh, is it safe to process a jar that is filled below the recommended headspace? No. Because like Sheila said earlier, it's a science. And that quarter inch headspace is important because it needs that space to force all of the air out of the product and for it to make, to make it safe. If you have too much headspace in there, then it's not going to get processed properly. And then it's not safe. And each type of food has a different headspace. Yes. Jams and jellies is almost all a quarter inch. Uh, fruits is a half inch. Vegetables are an inch. So just follow the tested recipes. Right. And be, you, you might have noticed I didn't use the measurer thing to figure it. And that's because I was looking at the rings. And if you look at the, you know, the rings that hold this on, the, the first ridge is a quarter inch. The second ridge is a half inch. The third ridge is your one inch. So I, that's what I was going by was that first ridge of the ring for my quarter inch. Um, but you can also use this, it looks like a little stair step tool and for the quarter inch, the half inch, you know, and so forth. Um, and so what you can do is put this on the rim for the appropriate level you want it and move it around and make sure that it's all at that level. Cool. And then uh, if a jar doesn't seal properly ever after processing, is it safe to still eat? Yeah, you have 24 hours after it's processed to find out whether or not it's sealed. And if it didn't seal, you could put it in your refrigerator and eat it. If you're not going to eat it within the next probably four to five days, you could put it in the freezer as long as it's got enough room to expand. Otherwise, you're going to break your jar. So you could actually take some of it out and put it in a freezer bag, freezer container, that sort of thing. Awesome. Uh, that seems like it is the end of our questions. So, All right. Uh, so thank you so much both for uh, doing this. This has been amazing. Uh, thank you, everybody who made it tonight. We're so excited that uh, you were here. Um, and on that note, uh, I will let everybody go. If you want to watch this video again, it will be on YouTube um, under the CSU Alumni Association page. And as on that note, everybody have a great night and go Rams. Yay. Great.